Hi, I'm Michelle the Irritable Vegan and today's video is perfect for anybody looking to introduce or increase the amount of plant foods in the diet. Whether you're looking to go fully plant-based, you're interested in increasing your fibre intake or you're looking to feed those gut microbiomes. This is the video for you. Let's get into it. Recently it seems like I can't go on social media, listen to a podcast or a YouTube video without somebody talking about the 30 plus plants challenge and I think it's a great thing that we're talking about getting diversity and variety into our diets but I can guarantee that there are some of you now watching this who are rolling your eyes and about to switch off because you simply can't see how you can possibly incorporate that with an already restricted low FODMAP diet. I'm here to show you today exactly how you can get that plant food tally up towards the 30 plus mark and share my experiences of doing this over the past several months. I'm going to split this series into a few parts. Today we'll go into a bit of the background science and I'll share an amazing free online course all about the gut microbiome that you really don't want to miss if you're a gut geek like me. I'll give you tips and tricks as to how I incorporated this into my diet over the past several months and how you can do the same. Then if you're interested in seeing the low FODMAP meals that I ate and how you can get that weekly tally up for yourself then I'll put all that in a second video. So despite the fact that this seems to be quite a new trend the research that the 30 plus plants challenge is based on is actually several years old. And it comes from a study that was done by the American Gut Project where they studied stool samples from over 10,000 people across the globe. And I won't even begin to pretend to understand the deep science behind it, but I will leave links to that if you are interested in delving a little bit more into that. But how it relates to this video is that their findings were that the unique number of plant foods that a person eats when comparing people who ate 30 plus plants in a week to those who ate less than 10, there was a direct correlation with the diversity, the health and the variety of microbes present in their stool and therefore in their gut. And in case you're not aware, the diversity of the microbiome in our bodies has actually been linked to improved gut health, mental health, brain function, immunity and overall health outcomes. Interestingly, it appears that this diversity is not intrinsically linked to whether somebody identified as vegan, vegetarian or omnivore. So in this specific instance, it's the variety and quality of the plant foods and not a strict adherence to plant foods only that seems to count. So this suggests that everyone can benefit from being conscious of the variety of plant foods in the diet. It's also a good reminder that if you're patting yourself on the back for being vegan, plant-based or vegetarian, but then you're only selecting from a very narrow variety of foods, then potentially your microbiome and your gut health could be in a worse condition than somebody that regularly eats animal products, but they're also conscious of the variety of plant foods within their weekly diet. So I hope you're beginning to see how this should be of interest to everyone no matter how you categorise your diet and how it's especially important to be aware of the need for that diversity when we're working through the low FODMAP diet. And if learning more about the impacts of gut microbiome on your overall health is something that you're interested in, then you'll be really pleased to know that during the research for this video, I discovered that the 15 hour online course that was set out by the American Gut Project to assist their citizen scientists, which are the people who took part in this original research, is still available to take for free online. I've taken this course and I've got to say that for a completely free resource it gives so much detailed in-depth knowledge that you can then apply to improving your own gut health. I'll leave a non-affiliate link for it in the description box below and I highly recommend it to anybody that's, that's interested in learning in depth and in detail about the microbiome. So now we've got a general sense of where the 30 plus plants challenge came from and why it's important. Let's look into how we can get involved and exactly what counts as a plant food when it comes to keeping a tally. And according to the original research questionnaire, the amount of a single plant food really appears to be quite forgiving. So I'll just read the question here. Participants in this study were asked in an average week, how many different plants do you eat 
e.g. if you consume a can of soup that contains carrots, potatoes and onions, you can count that as three different plants. If you consume multigrain bread, each different grain counts as a plant, include all fruits in total. So basing our tally on that quite broad description, you can already see that you've probably already eaten more plant foods than you give yourself credit for. But just to be clear, we can include all fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, seeds, and whole grains. Now, although the number of plant foods, when we use the example of a soup containing three plants, seems to be quite generous, they did actually then distinguish this from the next question, which was how many portions of fruit and vegetables do you consume in a day? And for the portions, they specified it to be half a cup, one medium piece, one cup of leafy greens, or half a cup of 100% juice. So they do acknowledge there that the overall number of individual plants is likely gonna be higher than how many full portions of plant foods are consumed within a week. Whilst researching this video, I came across dietitians and scientists that were suggesting that for the purpose of the 30 plus plants challenge, you really want to be looking at those foods that you're eating in at least a quarter cup serving. Now remember, that's a quarter cup serving throughout the entire week, not per portion or per sitting. Now, as someone that's confident that I'll eat enough plant foods within the week, this quarter cup limit is the basic rule of thumb that I've been sticking to. If, however, you're new to eating plant foods, you struggle to introduce new foods into the diet, you don't particularly have a very diverse diet at the moment, and you're worried about the additional fibre, then initially you may want to begin to count every single plant that you eat, regardless of portion size, and very gradually work up from there to the quarter cup servings throughout the week. And as this minimum quantity of a quarter cup didn't seem to be specified anywhere in the original research, then it is open to a little bit of interpretation. However, in terms of nutritional guidelines, for fruit and vegetables, a portion is considered typically 80 gram. For whole grains, it's half a cup of a cooked grain or one slice of bread. For legumes, it's half a cup of cooked lentils, beans or peas. And for nuts and seeds, it's a small palmful or roughly 30 grams. Now, these are obviously based on government nutritional targets and guidelines, not necessarily the low FODMAP portion sizes. But being honest, we're all creatures of habit. We're typically limited to the food that we have available in the house to us every day. And we are going to be repeating foods throughout the week. So for example, if you use a couple of teaspoons of chia seeds on your breakfast every morning, you're gonna be getting pretty close to that quarter cup serving for that particular plant. And the same goes for low FODMAP servings of legumes. A lot of people initially think that these aren't worth bothering with because they're in such small amounts. But a half cup of edamame beans, a quarter cup of lentils, chickpeas, black beans or butter beans all count as separate plants so they all count towards your overall plant tally as well as being great for your protein and fiber intake so it really is worth including these small amounts throughout the course of a week and it goes without saying that the less processed the plants the better for overall health but if the example of the soup is anything to go by then we don't need to assume that we have to exclude everything but entire whole plant foods from the tally. So what exactly have I learned over the last several months of eating like this and what tips do I have to share with you? So observation number one is that throughout the whole challenge I was off to a roaring start at the beginning of the week but then gradually things would slow down and virtually halt towards the end of the week. So every single week I had at least one or two days where I virtually had added nothing else to the plant tally. And this is just because I was eating leftovers, I was using up what I had in the fridge, I was eating what was available in the house, and I wasn't consciously attempting to add any more plants beyond what would have been my normal eating habits. So this leads me to assume that if you are able to buy smaller quantities or individual pieces of plant foods, 
then you are much likely to be able to get that variety in without food waste becoming an issue. So as a two person household on a small budget, we generally rely on more affordable um, supermarket options of, of larger bags of fruit and vegetables. Uh, so I can definitely see how this would be more of an issue for a single person household or for somebody working with a smaller budget. So to get this type of variety and stick to low FODMAP portion sizes, you really are going to have to shop savvy and potentially make really good use of your freezer to avoid wasting the excess. The good news is that so many of the items that we buy fresh and that would potentially go to waste can be safely frozen. Some of them may need to be cooked into a recipe or blanched first, but if you are all in, in any doubt, then please do double check that on the internet. And one of my favorite resources for this is the full freezer blog, which I'll leave a link to in the description box down below. And if your freezer space is at a minimum, then my top tip here for balancing your budget is to buy the hardier items in bulk which could potentially be cheaper so things such as potatoes parsnips carrots radish and even uh, living herbs in pots rather than cut herbs and then, then you can then reserve a, a larger amount of your budget if possible for the things that are likely to spoil more quickly you can buy those in smaller amounts things such as fresh berries leafy greens and tomatoes so that you don't have to then eat them at every single meal to avoid wasting them. And buying smaller quantities if possible is a really good idea for those foods that you know only have a small low FODMAP serving. So things such as avocado, corn on the cob, sweet potato and even courgette. So you can get the variety in but you're not having to rely on, on using up big bulk packs of them. And also for any new items that you might want to try or incorporate just into one or two recipes. Smaller quantities wherever you can will allow you to, to try them out without worrying that you need to, to use a great big bag full uh, potentially if it's something that you find out that you don't really enjoy. And if buying little and often is not an option then consider coordinating with friends and family to spread the cost and the quantity of those items that are cheaper to buy in bulk. You could also consider buying some of your items as frozen. And this means that you can just use a very small amount each day or each meal that you need and the rest of it can be safely stored without worrying about waste. Some of my favourite things to buy in bulk in frozen include berries, butternut squash, spinach, corn on the cob, sweet corn, edamame beans and green peas. This brings me on to my next point of trying at least one new plant food a week. Now if possible buy this in a single portion or again coordinate to buy it in bulk and share out the cost and the quantity between friends. And this is especially important for anyone that finds themselves stuck in a very restrictive mindset or FODMAP limbo when it comes to trying and eating new foods. If you've never challenged or re-challenged your FODMAP tolerances and you find yourself sticking to the same small amount of foods week in, week out, then this tip is really, really meant for you. Not everything is going to agree with your gut and you may not enjoy everything you try, but you'll never know unless you do try and your absolute next favourite food could be just around the corner. It's really easy to get into a rut with our food in adulthood and just being a bit, little bit brave and a little bit inquisitive really can help to get that diversity and variety of foods into the diet. Following on from that, my third tip is to not let the fact that you're on the low FODMAP diet stop you from trying to expand the range of plant foods that you eat. I'd actually argue that if you've done the low FODMAP diet, you're actually in a better position than the general population because you're used to already mixing and matching smaller low FODMAP portions of food to build up a meal rather than relying on huge mono meals that lack variety. And despite initial appearances, there are actually lots of plant foods that are available on the low FODMAP diet. You just need to be willing to balance them out with small servings of medium to high FODMAP foods alongside the FODMAP free and low FODMAP foods that we all tend to overly rely on. 
The Monash app is the best resource for showing you exactly which of those high FODMAP foods that you might otherwise rule out actually have low FODMAP servings that can be enjoyed in any phase of the diet. And a huge misconception in the elimination phase is that you can only eat FODMAP free or low FODMAP foods when in actual fact the creators of the low FODMAP diet have said time and time again that wherever possible as long as you stick to green light servings you can and should include high FODMAP foods in low FODMAP portions into your daily diet. This helps to reduce an overly restrictive mindset around food and helps to increase the quantity and diversity of the dietary fibre which is exactly what our gut and microbiomes need to thrive. Tip number four is particularly useful on the days where you're eating leftovers and that's to leave things like nuts, seeds and herbs as a garnish rather than including them in the main meal or sauce. That way you can swap and change them each day and you're adding in an extra one or two bonus points on the days where you'd generally be repeating foods. This can really help to keep your momentum and your motivation going just to see that tally going up by one or two plant foods per day when you thought that there was a day where you wouldn't be able to necessarily add anything. So for example, if you made a big batch of pine nut pesto that needed to be eaten within a few days, you're gonna be eating those pine nuts day after day after day and you're probably gonna be reluctant to add in any other nuts or seeds to try and avoid any issues with FODMAP stacking. But if you made the pesto nut free to begin with, you can then just grind up a different nut or seed each day, include that in the pesto, and not only are you increasing the variety, but you're also getting a little plant point in there where you might not necessarily have had one before. And another way to achieve this is to keep a small selection of living herbs, whether that be in the potted varieties that you can buy in the supermarket, whether you grow your own on the windowsill, or you have the luxury of growing in a garden. You can mix and match them, you can swap them out, use a different garnish day after day, and you're not worrying about those little wilted herbs in the fridge going to waste. The living herbs that I grow and buy typically last for months on the windowsill. And you can see that these ones don't look like the fullest or necessarily the healthiest herbs, but they're probably at least three months old at this stage, and they're still perfectly edible. Tip number five is that based on the criteria set out in the original study, which gave the example of a can of soup as containing three plants, then it's safe to say that we don't have to rely on only whole fresh produce. Don't dismiss frozen, canned, preserved, fermented, cooked, blended, processed or pre-packaged plant foods in your tally. It's safe to assume that if the vegetables in soup count towards your tally, then the vegetables in your favourite brand of low FODMAP cooking sauce will also count. And I'm a big believer that in some cases the nutrition in frozen food is actually better preserved than in fresh. For example, if like me, the food that you eat doesn't come organically grown from the local farmer's market and it has tended to travel a considerable distance and length of time to get to you. Since I began the low FODMAP diet, I've also done quite a lot of experimenting with things like pickled, preserved and fermented foods such as sauerkraut and pickled beetroot, which I really enjoy just a tiny amount of on either a sandwich or in a salad. Other preserved foods that also have low FODMAP safe servings include olives, sun-dried tomatoes, capers, gherkins and even pickled onions. Another benefit of pre-packed foods, I'm thinking particularly of sauces, soups and grains, is that they will often contain more than one plant. It's very rare that you're going to find a cooking sauce or a soup that only contains one ingredient and it might well be that the ingredients the other ingredients you might not necessarily use eat or buy at a full portion but having it in there can help to boost your tally now since starting this challenge i've switched out my usual plain pre-cooked rice and quinoa for ones that contain more variety things such as whole grain rice wild rice wheat berries barley, millet and sometimes even lentils and I appreciate that that's much easier to do once you have completed the low FODMAP diet but I am of course referring to the fact that there are some 
some brands available that are suitable for the low FODMAP elimination phase. And one of the simplest ways you can benefit from these bonus plant points whilst you're out and about shopping is to look for things like frozen mixed vegetables, stew packs, stir fry mixes, and even your salad greens to choose the ones that have a variety of leafy greens and herbs rather than just sticking to one single variety of lettuce. And finally, my biggest tip to making this work is every time you're cooking and dishing up to think what else could I possibly add? This could be as simple as throwing in some pre-cooked rice, quinoa or beans into a vegetable soup, from bulking up a smoothie with oats or flax seeds, to garnishing each meal with a selection of fresh herbs, chives, toasted nuts or seeds, nori flakes or baked sourdough croutons, all of which can add a valuable extra plant point. Now this may not come naturally at first, so don't beat yourself up about it. It is a learning curve and hopefully it's something that you're going to be able to continue to expand and build on over time. And even for myself, somebody who's a seven year vegan, who's experienced in eating only plant foods, I managed each week to find something additional that I could add into an already plant packed meal. And I just want to acknowledge that I really appreciate that for my IBD friends, the excess fibre in plant foods can be a real issue. I really hope that you're able to make use of a few of these suggestions during periods of remission and that by working closely with a dietitian, you can gradually, steadily and safely increase your fibre and your plant foods to a level that's individual and tolerable for you. Now, of course, if you're in elimination phase, you do need to be aware of the potential issues for stacking these individual plants together. And that is something that I can help you with. If you head on over to the website and sign up for the newsletter, you'll get instant access to a secret page on the site where you can download a free, detailed, in-depth FODMAP stacking ebook. Now this has been recently updated to reflect all of the recent changes to certain foods in the Monash app and it's a really good resource for understanding how FODMAPs stack over the course of a meal or a day and how that can potentially lead to flare-ups. Just pop over to the website to sign up and it will all become clear. So there you have it. I really hope this has encouraged you to start taking a look at the amount of plant foods you include in your diet. Please let me know if you're planning on keeping a tally and let me know how you got on in the comments below. As always, I'm eternally grateful for any action that you take on this video that helps boost its visibility so that it gets shown to more people just like you. Thanks so much for watching and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.